My guest this week is classical guitarist John Williams. John is one of the nation's most recognisable classical musicians, probably because he doesn't always stick to the traditional way of doing things. In 1978, he had a hit single with Cavatina, the theme music from The Deer Hunter. On stage with Pete Townsend at the Secret Policeman's Ball, he raised a few eyebrows by delivering an acoustic rendition of Won't Get Fooled Again. In my mind's eye, a very slightly younger-looking William stares at me from the cover of a remembered favourite LP, and his rock classical supergroup Sky enjoyed huge commercial success, if not critical acclaim. But he sold over half a million albums in the UK alone and has been lauded as the world's most accomplished all-round guitarist. John Williams, tell us whom you've chosen as your great life and why. I've chosen a wonderful, great uh, Paraguayan musician, guitarist, of course, Agustin Barrios Mangore, to give him his full name. Can you, John, pick out for us uh, from that any element of your answer to the question why you've chosen Barrios? One of the elements is in that bit of music we just heard because he had a fantastic technique. Not a rough and ready technique. It was very refined. Uh, It was a beautiful technique. But I would say that probably the most outstanding, most memorable thing about him is his romanticism, which which you can hear in... uh, the way he played and also in a lot of his compositions. Perhaps I give a little background to this, but the guitar in the 19th century was basically an amateur's instrument and there were a lot of very lovely little transcriptions of classical pieces and the guitarists sort of got together in little societies and and, uh, had a great time, much like they still do today. But it wasn't until Segovia, the great Spanish guitarist, uh, started giving concerts and playing with his fingernails which is very important because that makes a a very clear projected sound, which meant that he could play in concert halls, in quite large concert halls. And in the beginning of the 20th century, Scovia started doing that, and that raised the guitar to a whole new level. And it was about the same time that many other guitarists, particularly in Spain and in South America, were sort of doing the same thing, quite independently of Segovia. And Barrios became the most outstanding of of all those. I mean, now, with the benefit of hindsight, we look back in history, and it's not just his recordings, which, of course, are very, very... um, a lot of them very noisy. (laughs) Uh, But we can hear, you know, his style of playing and his nearly well, over a hundred pieces of, uh, that he composed. Because, of course, Barrios, we must remember, was both a performer and a composer. He was, and, and he was fantastic at, at both. You see, he used what we would say to listen to a very ordinary harmonies, easy to listen to, but in, in a way that was a little bit special, in, in a way that only someone, after the event, can look back with a certain nostalgia. For instance, if you look back at the 19th century, like perhaps Elgar looked back to, or was a product of Edwardian times here in England, you could say his music looked back in a way that the music of Edwardian times was different. But the way Elgar looked back on it had an extra sort of element of nostalgia and an extra element of development. So it, it, it wasn't simply a matter of reproducing exactly. that music from an earlier age, but... but um, Developing. I, I, yes. I perhaps give a couple of little examples on the, on the guitar. Do you think that's a good idea? And of myself here in the studio, because it'll be clearer than listening to Barry Russell's old recording. Yes. OK, these are the harmonies that he would use. <laughs> wrote it in an arpeggio format with a constant note sounding. Like that. I could listen to yeah. that <laughs> so, all day. Or, or, uh, and, and another example, of a very famous piece of his is the prelude to a piece called The Cathedral. He keeps this note going. Again, 
again, none of the chords or anything that would you would regard as modern or contemporary or like Schoenberg, for example, but they are slightly different from what they would have been had they been written in the 19th century. There's someone else I want to bring in now, joining us from a Washington studio to flesh out the life of Agustin Barrios, another Paraguayan guitarist who's been universally lauded for her interpretations of Barrios's compositions, Berta Rojas. Hello, Berta. Hello, Matthew. Hello, John. Very nice for me to be a part of of this interview in which we are talking about a national treasure of Paraguay, Agustin Barrios Mangore. I I want to come back to Paraguay itself in a moment, Berta, but but first I'd like to establish Barrios's name. I've been calling him plain old Agustin Barrios, but he's also known as Agustin Barrios Mangore, and you heard John a little while ago using that name. Why did he adopt the name Mangore? Where does it come from? Well, the idea behind it started to to show in Agustin Barrios' life when he was living in Brazil around the 30s. He adopted the name of Nitsuga Mangore. Nitsuga is only Agustin, his his first name spelled backwards, Nitsuga. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) And Mangore is the the name of an Indian uh, chief which we don't know really if it was a a real personality of the history of Paraguay or just an invented persona. But he adopted the name of the chief uh, Nitsuga Mangore, and he actually dressed as an Indian chief in his concerts when he was living in Brazil. I know Paraguay a, a little bit. And what distinguishes Paraguay not from Brazil but from the other Spanish South American countries is its to the outsider anyway, extraordinarily relaxed attitude towards race and colour, which you don't find in Bolivia or Colombia or Peru. It is in that sense, although it's been quite a tyranny from time to time, it is socially a very relaxed, mixed country. Do you think that that, that's important in in the makeup of Agustin Barrios? Yeah. Also, I believe that the, the mix of races and the mix of cultures in Paraguay. First of all, Mm. the European immigration that came to populate uh, Paraguay after the tremendous wars that we went through, you know. We have to remember that when John Williams was talking about the romanticism that is embedded in Agustin Barros' music, I tend to think and see Paraguay as a country that was, in a way, living a bit behind the rest of the world in the sense that Paraguay had undergone a a war, a five-year-long war against Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay in 1865 to to 1870. And only 15 years after that war that took the lives of three-quarters of the population of Paraguay is that Agustin Barrios was born. Yes. He actually used to perform pieces descriptive of the wars that Berta was relating to there, the wars of the Triple Alliance, you know, Paraguay against Argentina, Uruguay, and, and Brazil. So it's very interesting that throughout his career, I find you see these two elements in Barrios, this romanticism and personally periods of great depression and disillusionment with his own uh, life and his progress artistically and professionally. But I'm very struck with the fact that absolutely concurrent with that all the way through his life, he was known to be very sociable, incredible belief in himself and in the guitar. He was very poetic about the guitar as an instrument. At the same time, he was very sociable, so it wasn't like he was some introverted, despairing poet, which a lot of his photographs seem to indicate, but he wasn't. You know, he was he was both sides, and I think that's a, quite an important facet of him to, to understand. He was born, Berta, in 1885. Into what sort of family, what sort of circumstances was he born? He was born in the city of San Juan Bautista de las Misiones to a family that had the privilege of having access to a library, for instance. He belonged to a cultured family. His father was a vice consul of Argentina in Paraguay, and his mother was a school teacher. So I think that Agustin Barrios was, fortunately for him, uh, very well educated. No? Did your playing career begin, obviously not exactly like that, John, but, but also in circumstances where it wasn't hard and uh, you were encouraged? There were some similarities, but mine were really the opposite, because as far as the guitar was concerned, Barrios 
really, I think, Berto, you'll agree, it was all his own making. You know, it was mm. all his determination to be a guitarist. Mm. Whereas in my case, it was sort of handed to me on a plate. You know, my father was a guitarist. He taught me. I never thought of doing anything else. Incredible to be to be brought up, so to speak, with it absolutely assumed that you're going to be a guitarist I like know. your father. Did, did it seem strange to you at the, the time? Other little boys and girls didn't. I, I know. Well, no, I, I did think about it in my 20s. You know, you yeah. start reassessing, is this what my life is? Do I really want this? And I used to think, well, actually, I'm very lucky and I love it. But somehow would like to have chosen it myself from the beginning rather than my father doing it for me. However, I thought immediately, as soon as I thought that, that doesn't make sense. I might have chosen the wrong thing. Yes. You know, choice is not necessarily a good thing. When did you know that you, you had the, the talent to make it? I sort of assumed what my father said was true. You know, he said, you've got talent, you should make the most of it. You might want to do something else when you go up, but in the meantime, make the most of it. So I sort of fell into it, you know. Better as a guitarist, what, what attracts you to the compositions of Barrios? Are they fun to perform? Are they hard work? Well, for me as a Paraguayan, there's a sort of an identity issue with the music of Agustin Barrios. I feel it very much part of my of myself, part of my my own blood, you know. There are dances that he composed that are based on rhythms that I danced as a child, you know, like the Paraguayan polka, for instance, you know. And I feel in his music the essence of Latin America. And that's probably one of the parts of his music that is the most attractive to me, you know. The fact that you feel the the very soul of Latin America in his music. No? John, yeah. you've been credited with bringing Barrios to a wider audience when you released your recordings of his compilations right back in the 1970s. Yeah. What drew you to him in the first place? Barrios' biggest success almost anywhere that he went was in Caracas, in Venezuela, in the early 1930s. And he stayed there for about six months. And over a period of about the first month, he played 25 concerts in different halls throughout Caracas. And th that spawned and encouraged and gave birth to a whole movement of, of Venezuelan guitar music. And one of the great Venezuelan guitarists was a man called Alirio Diaz, who's still with us in his late 80s. And when I was a student in the 1950s in Italy, in Siena, and it was some guitar classes, summer school, Alirio Diaz gave me two pieces of Barrios, because they were the only two or three pieces that were actually published. So I had always played those two pieces. And then in the 1960s, a young medical student from... 1969. 1969, thank 69, you. Yes. <laughs> uh, from El Salvador, a man called Carlos Payet. He came through London with a whole lot of photograph copies of uh, manuscripts and early publications of Barrios's music. I mean, about 50, 60 pieces. And I sort of thumbed through those, if I can use the expression, more with my eyes than my actual thumbs. But, I mean, I went through them very, very thoroughly and was absolutely knocked out at the range and the quality of the music. It was really an absolute revelation to me. And that's what my early recording in the 1970s was, was based on. Better, John Williams is, is being too modest to claim that, that yeah. he helped give the music lift off, but, but he did, didn't he? He did. In El Salvador, where I was in Barrios, passed away in 1944, they very much believed that the music of Barrios needed to be in the hands of a great performer. And the Mangore people in, in El Salvador believed that the only way that the music of Barrios was going to be known and respected in the world of guitar and the world of music was if a great player performed his music. And so when Carlos Pages went to Spain, to study, uh, I think that he was uh, doing a postgraduate studies in psychology, is that he attended a concert of John Williams and backstage he showed him this music, you know, and I think that the, what Carlos remembers of this meeting with you, John, is that you Thanks. told him, this is beautiful, can you come to London and bring me the music? And So he did. Mm -hmm. And that's when you browse around and looked at the music and what Carlos remembers is that you fall in love with it immediately. Yeah, absolutely. Not to introduce a sour note, but early in his career, he was heard, Barrios was heard, by the Spanish virtuoso guitarist Segovia, who told him he was wonderful, but then went back to Europe and didn't do much to help him. Do you think Segovia was scared of the competition, John? Well, it's a very debatable point. Personally, I think probably that was the case. Actually, after that meeting in about 1920-21 in Uruguay, the rest of his life he wouldn't talk about Segovia. He said one remark someone saying, oh, he's just a technician, something like that. Mm. Mm. And one of the 
depressing aspects of, of his life for him, Barrios, was, was that he didn't hear anything from Segovia because he had this terrific, almost idolatry of Segovia at that period because Segovia was, as it were, already internationally known in Europe and he was a very assertive and very, very great player. And I think Barrios wanted to have a kind of kinship with him and also wanted him to recognise him and to help him. And, and Segovia said nice things at the time but never said anything else. And in fact, right up to the end of Segovia's life, when Segovia was giving classes, I'm talking about the 1960s, 1970s, he used to forbid anyone playing Barrios in his class. Mm. And I think it's a little bit to do with the, the, the attitude that all colonial powers have towards their ex-colonies. And it was very, very strong between sort of Spanish culture and popular South American or Latin American culture. Mm -hmm. And I, I see it round me still today. There's always that little tinge in the Spanish attitude which looks down on Latin American culture. Not, not as bad as it used to be, of course, but I think in those days it would have been quite strong. And the fact that Barrios, although he was, as it were, a, what we say a classical guitarist, he played just like we all do, the fact that his compositional roots were a lot of them were in popular music and his style of playing was very much from the heart it's a style which has now come back in our time in the last 10 years but has been frowned on to be so sort of open and uh, heart on sleeve but he breathed it like that Barrios and I think that would have not gone down well with Segovia and plus the fact that Barrios's music is extremely difficult to play and it's a kind of technique which is very spontaneously difficult. It's not studied. It's not for effect. And Segovia would have found... Uh, I know, I mean, Segovia was a great player in his own way, but he would have found Barrios's music very difficult to play. Mm. So there's a combination of reasons for it. Before we get our <laughs> violins out, as it were, uh, for, uh, for Barrios, we, you have to remember at this stage he was an extravagant uh, bohemian yeah. figure. There's no self-pity at all. He took to dressing up like a Paraguayan native, Mangore, the stage yeah. name taken from the folk heroes we've yeah. heard. He appeared on stage yeah. in native dress, surrounded by tropical plants, sometimes carrying yeah. bow and arrow, reciting the poetry he yes. composed. Do you think there's an element here of marketing, or did it really mean a lot to him, John? I think it was marketing, and it was at a stage of his life when he was really desperate. He had hoped to come to Europe. Segovia had promised to help him, or he certainly felt that that was a possibility. And in fact, in the mid-30s, he did come to Europe through the auspices of a, a diplomat a friend who was very helpful to him and acted as a sort of patron. But he never really worked, and then the Spanish Civil War broke out, and so he, he had to return to South America. But I don't think that makes any difference. I think for the reasons that Bert has talked about and the style of playing, that he wouldn't have made it in Europe at that time anyway. But imagine also, John, that he was playing in Brazil in the 30s. Yes. There's no history of classical guitar there. Yeah. You know, no. so he was trying to promote an instrument yep. uh, of a style of music that wasn't heard, that wasn't liked. That's right. He needed to establish an instrument and a yeah. style of music that wasn't in fashion in mm. Brazil at the time. No, but there That's are true. there are parallels. Uh, John, yes. between his life and yours, even, even though you yeah. came, in a sense, from su such different directions. Yeah. He began with the classics but refused to be railroaded down one right. track. You began with the classics yes. but had huge success with the group Sky for many years. Yeah. Going back to your first love, classical guitar, yeah. later on you, you performed with Pete Townsend. Did it. <laughs> he, he was criticised for his elaborate costumes. Yeah. You shunned traditional yes. concert garb for flowery cheese cloth ah. shirt in the 1970s. <laughs> I mean, you're both sort of moving in the same direction, aren't you? And criticised probably well, by the same rather snooty people. Well, I, I hate to draw parallels with such a great uh, historical person like Barrios, but I think the thing I recognise in Barrios are these two qualities because, I mean, actually all the things that I've done that you've referred to, they were never alternatives to playing classically. I've always played so-called classical guitar even playing the theme from The Deer Hunter. Mm. You know, you say one would say it at one stage that it was just film music, but actually it's played on a classical guitar, you know, with the same technique, the same sound I make when I play Bach or Vivaldi. So they're not different in that way. But it's Does not... it sting you at all, uh, John, when people are sniffy about your eclecticism or... or um... Or your clothes, or or, <laughs> or or the fact that your your reach is rather rather broader than the N classical concert. Not at all. You don't mind. Not at all. You know, this question of taste. Everyone has different taste. I think this question of recognizing beauty. I think if you don't get Barrios, 
in the sense of recognising, I think you've got something missing. I have to say that, you know, because that's beauty. It, it, the romantics, in whatever way they did it, kept in touch with beauty, you know, and that goes straight to the heart. And I think one thing that uh, we, we really mustn't forget is that although Barrios you know, reflected all this wonderful popular music in his playing and in his own compositions, a lot of, the, of his inspiration came from the classics, and classical uh, transcriptions, you know, of, of uh, 19th century piano pieces, Chopin, Beethoven, even Bach. You're listening to Great Lives. My guest this week is John Williams, who's chosen as his great life the Paraguayan guitarist Agustin Barrios Mangore. And joining us from a studio in Washington is the guitarist Berta Rojas. Both of you, uh, John and Berta, teach or have taught. You, you've taught John at the Royal School of Music. Yeah. Berta, you're talking to us now from the George Washington University, where you teach, and yet you, you're both distinguished uh, players. Is there a certain obligation to the next generation, a feeling that you've you've really got to keep things going and pass things on? John? I have a, a view about this which is not in accord with, with most people, so I'm, I'm a little bit careful to talk about it, but I, I'm not sure that the guitar... I think it is still too much in the wake of European classical tradition, and it's reflected in the curriculums of all the schools of music. In one sense, it's great that they have the guitar, 50 years ago, none of them even recognised the guitar. So it's, it's, it's a step forward. However, the world of music itself is changing. It's not just the guitar. And if we keep on trying to do what other instruments had 50 years ago, we're missing the opportunity with the guitar of its feet being firmly placed, or at least having one foot mm. <laughs> firmly placed in popular music. We've got to get over this idea that popular music is somehow less. It's something to do with entertainment, whereas classical music is kind of the best. You know, European classical music is only one of many music cultures in the world. Better. I, I totally agree with you, John. And from that perspective, I think that the work that you have done to try to bring to the concert stage the best of popular music, the best of classical music, and in the case of Agustin Barrios, the way he blends both worlds in his music, mm -hmm. I think that that's probably what makes the guitar different yeah. from any other concert instrument. No? He, tr he tried to establish a school, didn't he? That's right. Yes, he did. He did. And he used to teach wherever he went. There's lots of disciples. People remember lessons that they had in where Trinidad or yeah. Cuba or you know wherever it was. There he was. Yeah. Yeah. His last years in El Salvador, he was given a position at the National Conservatory of El Salvador, which he taught until he passed away. No? He yeah. seems to have had almost everything going for him except for timing. He was really unlucky. Yeah. in his career with timing. When, when he should have been taking Europe by storm, he was wandering South America, scraping a living together at little venues. He does go to Spain, just in time for yes. the start of the Spanish <laughs> Civil War, and when he tours Europe, World War II breaks out shortly <laughs> afterwards. It's surprising, isn't it, that um, after his death in 1944, that there wasn't a growing interest in, in a man who'd never quite been recognised when he was alive. That's right. Well, maybe if purely by accident that the music wasn't published but then he didn't always write his music out he used to improvise a lot and he had to be pushed by friends to actually write them out, that alone get them published so maybe that's a part of the reason maybe people would have been really impressed and, and, and knocked out by the music early if they'd been published and available however, I suspect not I suspect that the mood of the times and that maybe he was spared in Europe the fact that if he'd done an extensive tour, I suspect that the musical establishment, the musical elite of the time, were still not prone to accept a Latin American guitarist with popular leanings anyway. And it might have created even more disillusionment. So in a way, for all that that was his ambition, and he, another one was to get to the United States, which he never 
managed to do at all. I wanted to ask Berta about, about that, because that, that was sad. He was just on his way, wasn't he, Berta? Yeah, he to... wanted to arrive to, to the United States. He thought that fame and fortune uh, were awaiting for, for yeah. him in here, but he, he was, was never he yeah he was never able to, to get into the States. We don't know if he didn't have his passports um, in conditions or he didn't have a visa. We don't know what happened there, but the truth is that he was never able to make it to the Because he had United an invitation States. from RCA Records, but never made it to New York. He, never he died made just it, before. Sure yeah. Barrios composed the last song shortly before his death. John, it's a piece of music that demonstrated his love of storytelling. Yes. Tell us a little bit about it. Yes, well, the last piece, La Ultima Canción, it's often called the last song, but actually it's a name that's better and more truthfully known as Una Limosna por el Amor de Dios, an alm or a tear for the love of God. It's something which blind beggars say as they beg and they tap their stick to get attention and doing that. And the beginning of the piece is a, an evocation of the stick apparently knocking on the doors of heaven. Without, I can see your itching to play. Yeah, so. I'll just, I'll just play, show you the beginning of that piece. Please. goes on with that but it's lovely mm. so simple so simple but very evocative do you think john that born in another time or another place uh, you could see him playing on stage with pete townsend or touring with sky like uh, you oh un unquestionably he would have been a star today no question and in a way in the long haul he is a star so justice in the end is done and one just you know, has tears of the fact that he didn't live to, to see it. My thanks to John Williams and Berta Rojas, and we leave you with Contemplación. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this Great Lives podcast. Many other BBC programmes are available as podcasts. You can find details at bbc.co.uk slash Radio 4.